In this lesson, we're going to introduce the topic of statistics, and we're going to focus on uh, key terms and definitions that you should be familiar with. They'll be used throughout the course of the semester. We're not going to get into any calculations, but I'll describe those definitions, and then we'll get into some statistical concepts as well so you understand what the statistical process looks like. I want to start with this quote by Deming that says, In God we trust, all others must bring data. And hopefully by the end of this semester, you'll understand how we can use data to make decisions, um, come up with uh, good representations of information, decipher between good information and bad information, and then what we have to do in order to make sure that we have reliable summary values or summary graphics that represent that information accurately. And I think when we do data collection and we do analysis, using proper statistical methods, we come up with very good results that can help us in a variety of different ways. So statistics is really the science of collecting, organizing, and interpreting data. And this is kind of an oversimplified definition. There's a lot more to it than this, but this is a general idea of what we're taking a look at. And when we talk about statistics, we look at really two areas. We have descriptive statistics and we have inferential statistics. So descriptive statistics is really looking at describing data in a numerical fashion or describing it in a graphical fashion or graphic representation. Now most of the time we see graphics that are presented in the news, in the media, in textbooks, and research studies. Um, sometimes we see numerical measures as well like the average income of a U.S. citizen or the um, median weight of a child that's five years old. Those are some of the descriptive statistics we might see. And inferential statistics does something a little bit different. It allows us to draw inferences about the population based on the sample. And so as we progress through this course, we're going to learn about the descriptive statistics and then also how to apply inferential methods in order to draw conclusions about the population. One of the first things we have to understand is this idea of a sample versus a population. And I'm going to talk briefly about sample statistics. So first of all, a sample is a, is a randomly selected group that comes from the population. So in other words, a sample is a subset from the population. And when we talk about a sample statistic, sometimes we just refer to these as a statistic. And these are measurements from the sample. So typically when we talk about measurements from the sample, we are going to be using English letters to represent those. So if you look at this slide, you can see we have X with a bar over it. That represents the sample mean. S represents the sample standard deviation. S squared represents the sample variance, and so on and so forth. So make sure you understand how to denote when something is a sample versus something that is a population or a measurement from the population. So these are specifically sample statistics. Let's take a look at uh, population parameters. So a population parameter is a measurement from the population. Sometimes we just refer to this as a parameter. Now it's not very often that we go out and we gather data from the entire population. Most of the time we use a sample. But if we were to gather data from the entire population, we were to calculate a population parameter, we would use Greek symbols to represent those. And you can see right here I have the symbol mu that represents the population mean, sigma, which represents the population standard deviation, sigma squared, which represents the population variance, uh, we actually use a P in the classes that I teach to represent the population proportion, but some texts will use the symbol pi for a population proportion. I just don't like pi because pi is also a number and it's used in some calculations. So we use a capital P for the population proportion and then eta is the population median. So whenever we talk about a population parameter or just a parameter, if we were to actually take that measurement, we should represent that measurement with a Greek symbol that tells us that that is a measurement from the population. So make sure you can differentiate between a sample statistic and a population parameter based on what symbols are used, whether it's an English letter or a, a Greek letter in this case. Now, big picture, I want to talk about the population and the sample and kind of part of the statistical process. So, for example, when we talk about a population, we're talking about everything with that variable or characteristic that we're interested in. And most of the time, we don't know um, 
what those measurements are. And the only way that we'd be able to find out is if we collected data on everything from the population. And there's a number of reasons why we wouldn't necessarily want to go out and gather data on the population. And some of those reasons include the amount of time it would take to gather that data, the cost of gathering all that information, the um, impossibility of collecting the data on every individual. Sometimes it's just physically impossible. And then, you know, if we're doing something like manufacturing, it might be physically impossible because we might be destroying parts in the process of trying to collect the data on those things. So, for example, we have uh, a sample size right here. Actually, I shouldn't say a sample size. Capital N is the population size, and this is 328.2 million. This is actually the the population or, or or what Google says is the population of the United States in terms of individuals living in the United States in 2019. So we use a capital N to represent the population size and maybe we want to know something about everybody in the United States. Well if you think about it collecting data on 328.2 million people is going to be very very difficult. It costs a lot of money, take a lot of time, and it might be physically impossible because people are consistently being born and also dying during the time that we're trying to collect that data. So mu and sigma are unknown, but we'd like to know something about them. So the way that we might want might be able to figure out something about these two measurements is to take a sample from the population. So maybe we take a sample of 100 individuals. So we use a lowercase n to represent our sample size. And I just picked a number 100 to put in there because that's much smaller than what the population size is. Now when we do this, we're we're going to want to make sure that we apply probability. And we'll talk about this later on, but there's a number of reasons. So we might be using what's called a simple random simple random sample to select individuals from the population. And when we use a simple random sample, we're applying probability. We're trying to do something to ensure that everyone from the population is equally likely to be chosen in the sample of 100 individuals that we're taking. And so, for example, we might be looking at income of individuals in the United States. And I know this is a really simplified version. If you think, well, the population is 328.2 million, not all those people are working. Um, some might be children that are not eligible to work yet, and some people might be retired and they're not working at all and they're not in the labor force. So we might have some qualifying questions to determine what our sample is. Uh, we call that the sampling frame, and that defines who we're looking for in order to select for our sample size. So there's there's a lot that goes into this and I'm oversimplifying it, but we'll just say that this is the population size and this is a sample that I drew from that. Anyways, with the sample we might find from those 100 individuals that the average salary was $58,021. So that's our sample mean, that's a measurement from the sample. And then our sample standard deviation on those individuals was 12,280. Again, that's a measurement from the sample. Notice English letters for those two measurements. And then we have our sample size of 100. So this is the mean for those 100 individuals and this is the standard deviation for those 100 individuals. Now, this is what these two values that right here are called, are what are called a point estimate for the population parameters. These are just estimates of the, the corresponding population parameters. So X bar estimates mu and S estimates sigma. We don't really know what these values are, but these are estimates. And if we did a good job with our random selection, these might be representative of those values. And you're gonna find that in statistics, there's good ways to do things. And then there's often ways that are much better in order to estimate those parameters. So one way that might be better is to use what's called a confidence interval to estimate that population parameter. And we'll talk about these later on, but a, a confidence interval gives us a, a realistic estimate of a range of values that that parameter could take on with some level of certainty. So when we go back the other way to estimate those parameters, uh, with a confidence interval, we're applying probability to go back over here. So we, I'm using this example where we have a T distribution, which is a probability distribution, and we want to use that to estimate our population parameter mu. And we would use this formula right here, which is X bar plus or minus T times S over the square root of N. We'll learn about this later on. But anyways, if we apply these values and we look up that confidence level multiplier from a table, we can estimate 
um, our population mean with some level of certainty, some level of probability. So we could be 95% certain that our population parameter falls within that range of values. So that's a little bit better because now we have some sort of quantifiable um, way to state that we are fairly certain that our population mean would fall within those uh, values. So this is um, a real quick way to kind of think of this, this cycle of what we're doing in statistics. Um, we're always trying to estimate population parameters and, and we want to have reliable estimates of that and we need to apply certain things like probability, random sampling, all that sort of stuff in order to ensure that we have fairly reasonable estimates and the goal is to reduce bias or eliminate bias in this process. Now a couple other things that we have to know before we get started in um, to doing any sort of analysis is we have to understand that there are different variable types that we're going to be analyzing and typically we talk about these in terms of quantitative variables and categorical variables. So categorical variables sometimes can be called attribute variables or qualitative variables and categorical variables are things that we can categorize or classify. So gender is an example of a categorical variable. Ethnicity is a categorical variable. Color of hair or eye color, those are categorical variables. The type of car you drive, whether it's a Ford, a Chevy, um, uh, Audi, whatever it is, those are categorical variables. We can only classify those things. We can group them. When we talk about quantitative variables, some texts will refer to these as measurement variables sometimes, but quantitative variables are things that we can physically measure like height and weight, uh, family size, the amount of money we earn in a year. And when we talk about quantitative variables, there's two types of quantitative variables. We have discrete quantitative variables and we have continuous quantitative variables. Discrete variables or discrete quantitative variables are measurements that have gaps between the values. So for example, if we were talking about your household size, you would say that there's one person in your household, two people, three people, four people living in your household, so on and so forth. So those have gaps between the values because you can't have a fraction of a person. You can only have whole people in terms of counting those individuals. But I don't want you to think that discrete quantitative variables are only whole numbers. So another example of a discrete quantitative variable is your shoe size. When you go to the shoe store, you typically buy shoes in increments of halves. So you can buy a seven, a seven and a half, an eight, an eight and a half, so on and so forth. And when we talk about shoe size, there's gaps in between those values. There's, there's no values in between a seven and a seven and a half in terms of uh, buying a shoe size in US shoe sizes. So those are examples of discrete quantitative variables. So think about measurements that have gaps in between them. Continuous variables are um, quantitative variables that have no gaps in between the values. So when we talk about a value like height, if we have a precise enough measuring instrument, we could say we have somebody that's 71.25975 and we could keep going on indefinitely in terms of the level of precision of that measurement. So when we talk about continuous variables, those are things that don't have gaps between them like height, uh, weight's another one if we want to go precise enough for the weight to the nearest hundredth of a pound or thousandth of a pound. Um, but those don't have gaps between them and those are continuous variables. And we just have to know that because it may determine how we interpret that information in the end. Now when we talk about variables, we have to understand that there are different levels of measurement. And I'm going to go through these real briefly, and I think these are really important, especially if you're using a software like SPSS where you have to define the type of measurement uh, that you're looking at when you either type in data or import data. But the different types of measurement are nominal, ordinal, and scale level of measurement. Now scale is really looking at interval and ratio level of measurement kind of lumped together. So I'm not going to differentiate between interval and ratio level of measurement, but I'll start with nominal level of measurement. Nominal level of measurement is um, really a categorical variable. It's like ethnicity, gender, hair color, favorite color, type of car you drive. So those are things that can be classified or grouped, and we might represent those with specific measurements and graphics. So we have to kind of understand that.
ordinal level of measurement is a measurement that takes on an additional characteristic like for example the example I have is grade in school you could be um, described as a freshman a sophomore a junior or a senior based on the number of credits you have taken and we can rank rank you in terms of the most school you've completed to the least amount of school that you've completed a senior has completed more schooling than a junior a junior's um, completed more schooling than a sophomore, so on and so forth. So ordinal level of measurement takes on that additional characteristic of being able to be ranked. Now you might be thinking, well, can't ordinal data also be nominal data? Yeah, it can. You know, we could classify you as a freshman, a sophomore, a junior, a senior, but we always want to um, we always want to uh, assign the highest level of measurement to that variable possible because we can do other things with it, and we need to understand that. Now scale level of measurement, these are things like height and weight, and these are strictly quantitative uh, measurements when we talk about uh, scale level of measurement. So height and weight, um, that would be our discrete and our continuous uh, variables that we would look at in the scale level of measurement. And again, we might use different measurements and graphics in order to represent that information. So we have to understand what those are. And I know that scale level of measurement, you could say, well, you could rank height uh, Tall, tallest to shortest. So yeah, scale can take on ordinal level of measurement. But again, I want to go back to that idea that um, we want to always classify data in terms of its highest level of measurement because of the different things that we're going to be able to do with it, especially when we classify it in software. We have to be very cognizant of how we put that into the software so that way we can use those, those features in that software. Now, variable type is actually really important because this is going to define the types of measurements and graphics that we're going to be able to use and apply for that measurement. So one of the first things we always want to do is be able to identify the variable type. If it's a quantitative measurement, it might be appropriate to use the sample mean and then also represent that graphically with what's called a histogram. And we'll learn about those later on. If that type of variable was a categorical variable, we'd probably want to look at that maybe in terms of a proportion and we might want to look at a bar graph. So those are, are different things that we would want to make sure that we are paying attention to because those, those different measurements or those different types of variables are going to define what graphics and uh, measurements are available to use for that to accurate, accurately represent that information. Now I want to shift gears for a little bit and I want to talk about the statistical process so you understand or have a general understanding of what goes on in the statistical process. And this is an oversimplified version of it. Generally the statistical process is going to start with a question that's going to drive some sort of research like how much force does it take to break this um, cable that's supposed to hold up a bridge or um, what is the average income of an adult U.S. citizen that's in the, in the labor force right now. So the question is the thing that starts off what we're trying to research or find out something about and then we'd move into sampling, data collection, data analysis, reporting, and then decision making potentially at the end. Now in this process there are a bunch of subtasks that may take place. For example, in the data analysis part before we get to this we may have to do what's called data cleaning and get our data into what's called a tidy format but we're not going to address that at all in this class and sometimes we have to do things that are a little bit cyclical so we might um, do our data collection and find out we don't have a large enough number of individuals that meet the criteria in order to help us do the analysis so we might have to go back and uh, rethink about our sample and then collect additional information. So sometimes some of these subtasks can be uh, cyclical as well, but overall this is kind of the big picture of what it looks like. Now let's take a look at the breakdown of these different um, subtasks. So the most important thing I think is the question. This is what defines a problem. It helps us determine the population of interest uh, that we want to get the information from. It identifies potentially the variable type or the data needed. It determines the type of al analysis to be performed. Um, and I think this is probably one of the most important things that you can do if you're doing any research at any point. And I do recommend if you do research, you spend a lot of time really thinking about the question before you move forward because this is going to set up the rest of the stuff that you do in terms of the statistical process. So make sure you pay attention to the question really what you're looking at. The next 
kind of step is defining how you're going to do your sampling, all right? So we're looking at sampling methods. We have a simple random sample, a systematic random sample, a stratified random sample, a cluster, ran a cluster sample. Now with sampling, one of the most important things is that we use some sort of randomization in order to select the individuals that we're gathering the data from. And those individuals could be people, they could be parts, or whatever and the reason we want to make sure that that's a random selection is we're trying to reduce or eliminate sampling bias so we want to be very cognizant of that when we go through and we do the sampling and I'm not going to explain each one of these I encourage you to read about those different sampling methods in your text uh, but it's important that we know and we understand a little bit about those things now there are other methods in order in order to get data that you may read about or hear about such as volunteer samples convenience samples quota sampling and I could go on and some of those are not advisable because they might not really apply randomization so in other words you might get some very biased results of using some of those other methods that I just mentioned so we want to make sure that we apply randomization. I can't stress that enough. That's a really important thing. And remember, randomization is trying to ensure that everyone or everything from the population is equally likely to be chosen. Once we've um, defined how we're going to do the sampling, now we have to uh, take a look at our, our research method, how we're, how we're going to um, get that data. So it could be from a paper pencil survey or a phone interview, so a sample survey works. We could do it from an observational study. Maybe we're having participants come in and we're measuring their height and we're observing that variable of interest. It could be a designed, designed experiment where we're imposing some sort of condition in order to elicit a change and we're measuring that change from before to after. It could be meta-analysis where we're using already um, completed studies and using the data and the information from those studies to perform a study maybe in a slightly different area or using it in a slightly different way. And we could also be doing case studies. In this class, we're going to really focus on observational studies and designed experiments. We should be able to differentiate between those two things. An observational study, I just want to emphasize this, is something where um, we're observing the variable of interest. We're not imposing any conditions or any treatments or anything like that. We're simply um, taking the measurement and moving on. A designed experiment is a little bit different. And probably the easiest example I can give you is right around January, there's a lot of advertisements for weight loss drugs. And so if we were doing a designed, designed experiment to see if the weight loss drug actually worked, what we would do is we would randomly select a group of participants. We would divide them up into a treatment group and a control group. And the treatment group, uh, we would probably, and, and the control group, we would take their measurement before they started taking any drug. The treatment group would get the actual drug. The control group would get a placebo. And then after a certain duration of time, we would weigh them or take that, that weight measurement after that duration of time, and we might look at the change. So with the design experiment, we're imposing some sort of condition to elicit a change at the end, and that, that condition that we're uh, imposing is we're assigning them a drug, and we're measuring how effective that drug is by looking at how much weight they lost between the two groups, the treatment and the control group, and then we're comparing the treatment and the control group to see that um, really there's not a placebo effect. In other words, that the drug actually works when we compare those two groups. So we wanna see if there's significantly more weight loss from taking the drug versus the placebo. So that's really the difference between a designed experiment and an observational study. Make sure you read up on that because those are the two areas we'll focus in. After we collect the actual data, we're going to do some sort of analysis. And those could be numerical sum summaries, graphical displays, hypothesis testing, regression analysis, statistical process control, confidence intervals, and I could add other things in here. But these are some of the things that we're going to learn about in this class. We're going to focus primarily on learning about numerical summaries, graphical displays, hypothesis testing, uh, simple linear regression, which is a component of regression analysis, and then confidence intervals. Those are some of the main areas we'll focus on in this class. And then after we do the analysis, usually we do some sort of reporting and or decision making. And we want to make sure that we base our reporting and our decision on statistical evidence. So we don't want to base our, our results on one individual. We want to base our results on 
on our random selection of individuals and what the analysis is telling us. Now, in this whole process, like I said earlier, we're trying to avoid different types of bias. There's sampling bias, there's non-response bias, there's response bias. Um, these are the things that we want to avoid in terms of our collection because anytime we include bias, that kind of skews or distorts our results and causes us to have inaccurate or um, non-representative results of the population. Remember in the process, most of the time we are trying to make a generalization about the population and we can't go out and collect the data on the entire population. So we use a sample to draw an inference about a population. And we want that sample to be um, uh, representative of the population. We want to eliminate the bias. And typically we, we eliminate or reduce the bias by ensuring that we use good randomization techniques in the selection of our data. Now good sampling uses randomization as a part of the design. Um, the other thing that we want to do is we also want to use replication and that's to validate results. So sometimes it's better to take a couple different samples rather than just a one and done sample. Experimental studies should use a control group and a treatment group to make sure there's not a placebo effect. And then when we do experiments, we should also use things like blinding and double blinding um, in order to ensure that um, that that the, the participants um, don't know whether they're getting the drug or the placebo so we can look at the actual effect of that drug or placebo and also to make sure that the the person administering the drug and the person receiving the drug um, don't know what's going on in terms of who's getting what because we don't want any um, Freudian slips where somebody tells them what they're getting the placebo or the actual drug uh, because that could have an influence on the results as well so this gives you a general overview or general idea of the terms and definitions you should be aware of along with kind of what the statistical process looks like and moving forward from here we will take a look at how we actually do some of these calculations and apply some of these ideas and these concepts.